And there was no American made professional skincare product. And Dermalogica was the first. We launched 27 products in one shop and we did a million dollars in our first year. This is your life. You own it. That's a huge responsibility. No, don't, you don't blame others because if you do, you just handed responsibility for your life to another person. Take the responsibility yourself. Jane Werwind grew up in England on food stamps. Eager to change the course of her life, she started working on Saturdays at a salon at the age of 13. In the 80s, she moved to the US with a suitcase and a beauty school diploma with plans to change the skincare industry. A few years later, she founded what would become the number one brand in the professional skincare industry, Dermalogica. I'm so excited for you to hear today's episode. I know you'll walk away so inspired as you learn about Jane's journey and the keys to her success. I'm Erica Kohlberg, this is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with Jane Werwind. One of the things I really admire about you, Jane, is that you were quite the underdog. You didn't go to college and you didn't really have all of these accolades that when you look at the people who are successful now, a lot of them have that. And so to me, your story is just so inspirational because it makes, it makes me feel like this is so possible to achieve. Yeah. You know, what is it about you that even though you didn't have the college degree, what made you successful? Mm. That's a really interesting question. Some, some years ago, um, I was doing a, I was on a panel and somebody said, well, you know, your story isn't relatable because you're obviously an exception. And my answer to them was, actually, I'm, I'm not an exception. Um, and even though my story might feel exceptional, it was through a series of opportunities that I seized and jumped on that made it happen. But there is no reason, there's no magic formula to how to be successful that I know of other than, and I know you know this, Erica, you, you believe in yourself, however hard sometimes that is, because we all have imposter syndrome. We all have that day where you're thinking, oh, I'm really not all that. We all have that day where you wish you hadn't put on the dress you put on, or whatever it is. And yet the challenge is, okay, knowing that, can you push through it and still do whatever it is you're meant to do? And, and I feel that if we can manage that, that becomes a way to push through it. So for me, um, my story began, I guess, really young when I was two years old, because that age was a pivotal year for me because my father died. And my mother was left with four children, four girls to raise. I'm the youngest of four. Um, at age 38. And now I have two children. And, you know, I'm thinking when I was 38, if I'd had, if I'd been left, I don't know how I would have managed. I have no idea how my mother did it. I develop increasing in inspiration and admiration for her, even though she passed away 20 years ago. But the way that she did it was because she had a skill set training. She was a nurse. And the one thing she said to my sisters and myself was learn how to do something, five words that just resonated with us. Because if my mother had not had a training and been able to go back to work literally the week after my father passed away, and there was no plan B, she did not have a family support system. She did not have a trust fund. She did, they didn't even have a mortgage insurance on the house that they had just moved into out of social housing three months before, she didn't have a choice. And I think that role modeling really impacted all of my sisters and myself. And so that led me to wanting a skill set that I could train and own. And my mom would say, don't just learn something. Don't just do something. Learn how to do something. And so I went to study skincare. I got my first job at age 13 in a salon working on a Saturday. And then I left high school at 18 and went to study skincare, knowing that if I really became skilled at this, that would be my ticket out of, you know, the, the lunch voucher program, the free school uniforms, the, the, the food 
stamps and credits that I'd grown up with, that would be my ticket to having a secure future. I would be able to support myself. So that was the start of the story. And now I'm, I'm in my 60s, I'm 64. I can look back and see how all those dots, which seemed random at the time, actually all joined up like those puzzles where you connect the dots as a child and you suddenly realize oh my gosh you know it's an elephant or whatever the heck it is and I realized oh my gosh that skill set training led me to building my confidence that I know how to do this I can I can wax a bikini line in seven minutes you know which is <laughs> crazy as that seems that is a very deeply assuring skill set. I still, I travel to, to places all over the world, which is so great. I love traveling. But it doesn't matter if I'm in a small village in Italy or a tiny little island off the coast of Scotland, both of which happened to me in the last six months. I always look for a salon because if I can find one salon, I think, oh, I could get a job here. I'll be all right. <laughs> you, know, which, you know, the skin thing doesn't work out. I'll be OK, which is a bit redundant now. However, I, I know that to be a truth. And, and that, that threaded through into creating Dermalogica, threaded through to me having the confidence to emigrate to another country. If they've got skin, I've got work. Um, it, it threaded through to me feeling even in the most intimidating crowds, uh, I've got this because they know a lot about what they know about, but I know about what I know about really, really well. So, you know, I don't know a billion things about a billion things, but I do know this. And so crazy as that is, it gave me the confidence to, to push through every adversity and always remember where I came from, always, because if you lose that, you've lost yourself. It's like a map. Two things you got to know when you're making a journey. We just spoke about driving from Las Vegas to LA. You've got to know where you are now, so Las Vegas, and where do you want to get to, Los Angeles. Once you've got those two points, now you've got to figure out the way to get there. And there's lots of ways to get there, on a train, on a plane, I guess you could ride a bike in a car. Maybe you could walk. It might take you three weeks, but there we are. As long as you've got your two fixed points, you can figure out the middle bit, as messy as it is. Even if you get a flat tire, you take a wrong turn, you'll figure it out. There's a way to do it. And lo and behold, when we set ourselves those two things, you, you left Las Vegas and here you are. You're in Los Angeles. You made it. So I know where I came from. I know my background. I feel confident with my skill set. It's like I've got my car, my vehicle. Yeah. And I strongly believe in visualization. I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to be financially independent. I wanted to do that through my own skill set. And I wanted to be prepared to take a risk. At 18, going to the skincare school, did you have a vision that you wanted to create your own product line at that time or how did that come to be no i did not i i knew there's no plan b i don't i you know i there's nothing else i really want to do i love this work i knew i loved it because i'd worked in a salon since i was 13. i know it's not just about the treatment i feel strongly if i can become really really good at this this is going to be my ticket I can't say, well, I'm going to try this and see oh, if I don't, this doesn't work out, I'll fall back on my, you know, on something. I don't have another choice. I don't, I can't go to my mum and say, oh, you know, could you f sub me for three months living expenses? What, I mean, what are you talking about? So no. So I determined I was going to be the most skilled skin therapist I could be. And I was really fortunate because the class I went into, there were 12 of us. And one of the students there, her name was, I mean, it's so funny that I remember this, Dewey, Dewey Sakano. She was from Indonesia. She had no plan B either. She and I were absolutely determined that we had to learn everything, do everything. We brought our own lunch and you know, made our own sandwiches and brought our own lunch. Everyone else in that class was actually there to continue to renew their student visas in any oh. way, shape or form. 
And all 10 of the other students were from the Middle East and they had come and were staying in the country on on student visas. So actually they were they were lovely. They were great fun, but they had no interest in really learning what it was all about. So Dewey and I said, oh my gosh, all of them will be our models, our clients. <laughs> so there was oh my gosh it was fantastic we both of us had five clients each that we'd rotate which were class members and our teacher Rita Kelsey she didn't mind a bit because she knew that we were going to go on and take this work oh we waxed them we give gave them skincare treatments every single day we were massaging there was not one inch of any of those bodies that I did not know <laughs> and it was fantastic and from that we really honed our skill sets and then I went to a salon and did an apprenticeship, which means you're learning and earning. And so I could then learn how the business worked and how how you booked your clients and, and how it was possible that while a mask was on someone's face for 20 minutes, I had the speed to go and do a bikini wax in the second room and have an apprentice of my own so that we could, you know, and I learned that the person you take care of in a salon is the front desk because they're responsible for booking you. And if you're a client of any salon, uh, make sure you always take care of that front desk person because when you want that appointment on, I don't know, Thanksgiving Eve at five in the afternoon, that's who's going to get it for you. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, all of that. I didn't know I was going to have a product line. I did know very strongly this industry was going to be my home. And then from there, I, I figured it out. My first job was working as a makeup artist for Mary Quant, who was a huge fashion designer in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it was 1976. And uh, yeah, that was, that, was my, that was my first job. And I became a makeup artist for her, which taught me two things. First of all, I love to travel. Secondly, and I'm I'm pretty good at it. Secondly, um, I'm not the best makeup artist in the world. I'm good enough, but I don't love it. And therefore I realized that isn't that's not going to be my go-to. So two years with Mary, and then I emigrated and uh, I knew it was skincare. That was my love. What was the general knowledge around skincare at that time? Did people know that you have to put on sunscreen? What what was that like? No, and in fact, the sunblocks at that stage were um, zinc oxide and maybe titanium dioxide. We, it was the opposite. We didn't even call them sunblocks. It was sun tanning lotion. So everyone wanted to tan. There were two, the two top selling products at that time in that category were sun tanning lotions, sun tanning products, and skin lightening lotions. That shows you how crazy opposite you know culture was influencing things that they, has no business influencing mm -hmm. that's all changed the skincare knowledge in the UK and in Europe was pretty strong we had a very well established industry but when I came to the states I should have done my homework assuming the industry would be just as well established here and I came to Los Angeles I thought everyone was getting a skincare treatment every, you know, sort of three days. It seemed like that on the television and in the movies. Wrong. The training was 600 hours, which was about four months. Very weak. And only seven states out of the 50 even had a license. Most of the states, including New York, mm -hmm. you, there was no such thing as becoming a skincare therapist. That term wasn't used. We, they were called cosmeticians. And the knowledge was very basic. So I came to LA and I thought, well, I've got to get a job in a salon because this is what I know how to do. And I went to the yellow pages. There was no internet. I immigrated here in 1983. And I realized um, all the salons I could find were in Beverly Hills. So that's pretty elitist. Mm -hmm. And when I looked in the yellow pages, they were all, they seemed to all be owned by Europeans. It was Aida Tibiont, uh, Georgette Klinger, Christine Valme. And Aida Gray. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to ask if they're hiring. So I literally called up. And all, but once they heard my accent, they assumed, and they, then I told them I was trained in Europe. Then I got an interview right away. Mm -hmm. So what I learned in that, in, in that round of interviews was they wanted to hire European trained skin therapists because the training wasn't in place mm -hmm. in the States. So all the, the universe you know, conspires to show you your path if you're paying attention. 
So I walked out of that thinking, those interviews thinking, wow, is that is that true that their the education isn't good? Why don't they have the same education? You know, again, I didn't do my research. My boyfriend at that time, who then became my business partner, who is now my husband, and we're still together, oh. I'm very happy. My boyfriend at that time, Raymond, said at the same time, the universe, he got a job as a sales rep for a skincare equipment manufacturer out of Japan, Takara Belmont, one of the best manufacturers in the world with a huge market and industry and reputation. So we're both excited. He's got a job. I've got, I've got an opportunity. And what we learned very quickly from him not being able to sell one piece of equipment because no one in the market understood what any of the equipment did mm-hmm. and they hadn't been trained to use it, we realized the opportunity was in education. I was going to upskill skin therapists who had a cosmetician license and give them the training they would need to be successful. And I had my teaching credential, which I had already earned by the time I came to the States. And I started in a thousand square feet in the Arena Del Rey, walking distance from our one bedroom apartment and started a teaching um, education company called the International Dermal Institute. And I had a a through line of students because one thing I quickly realized is, especially in California, we want to we want to improve, we want to learn, we want to go for it, we want to be entrepreneurs. And so I had the most incredible students. And I have to say, most of them stayed with me all the way through to their own retirements, which was such a joy to actually have a core of several hundred students that I watched their careers. And in 1986, we launched the product simply because my students told me we don't have a product that we can use that we believe in. And all the products available to them were coming out of Europe and they were paying customs duties and shipping costs. And there was no American made professional skincare product. And Dermalogica was the first. Do you remember what the first product you launched was? Well, we just because we didn't know you couldn't do it, we launched 27 products in one shot. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So it took us nine months from beginning to end to formulate with a chemist working 16, 18 hour days. Uh, I don't think my skin has ever been so abused in my life because I was, you know, if we had three submissions of skin prep scrub, which was the first product approved, I I tested every single product. I used every product. I was very specific on the tactile feel of the product because being a skin therapist, you're using the product in the treatment room as well. And so the feel of it is critically important. Not how well does it rinse off only when you're leaning over your basin at home, splashing your face, but how easily does it remove when I'm removing it from a client's skin with sponges and warm water? That's a whole different experience when you're trying to remove a cleanser from a client's skin than when they're doing it themselves at home. So the unique thing about Dermalogica was we were road testing from a skin therapist's point of view mm-hmm. and as a consumer point of view. Skin Prep Scrub was the first product approved. How did you fund all of the testing <laughs> and everything at that time? With no money. We managed to cobble together through both of Raymond had emigrated from South Africa. I'd emigrated from the UK via South Africa. And we we emigrated uh, taking every bit of savings that we had, each of us. And also, you know, any anything we could sell. We came with one suitcase each. We sold whatever we could. We raised um, $14,000. And that was our stake. And by that time of... Um, of Dermalogica, we'd been training people for three years. So we'd been, you know, we did not buy a thing. We had a moratorium on any clothing other than those days, pantyhose and underwear. That was it. You couldn't buy anything else. We, and we didn't, we were very, very frugal. We lived in a one bedroom apartment. We, um, we ate at the local diner. A big night out was, you know, a burger at Tiny Nailers. And uh, box wine from Save on Drugs. That was a huge treat. I mean, that was how we did it. Yeah. And we just saved. So $14,000 we self-funded. And what that $14,000 did was it allowed us to produce the packaging, get the packaging bought, get the cartons bought. And we did a deal with a cosmetic chemist. And one of the very few who even agreed to meet with us 
and also make a product which at the time was unheard of, no mineral oil, no lanolin, no formaldehyde, no color, no fragrance, um, no SD alcohol, um, and also acidic balanced for the skin. It, it was unheard of. We talk about clean beauty now. You know, I wish it was clean skincare because I, it isn't about beauty. It's about health and and um, and really thinking about how do I how do I drill this down to the most perform performance based product that I can with nothing you don't need. The product doesn't have to be pink. You know, your toothpaste doesn't have to be blue. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous that we worry of our snacks. You know, it's artificial color when you could be using turmeric instead of that orange thing on, you know, whatever it is. So all of that was very, very important to us. And coming from my background and also my my mum and my sisters who were all nurses, um, there was a no-nonsense family. You know? So <laughs> all of that fed into, you know, informing what I liked and didn't like. So this $14,000, we cut a deal with a chemist and we we basically managed to cut a deal with him that allowed us to pay him a percentage of the ingredients we used to manufacture the product. And I I, I wrote a book uh, in 19, sorry, 19, we're in the two, 2000s, Jane, in 2020, which got published in 2021, where I explained this in a little bit more detail. But basically, if we didn't get to production and we didn't make product, he wasn't going to be paid. So his payment was over two years and based on the fact that we actually made products. So if we weren't successful, he wouldn't make money. And that's how we we did it on $14,000. Wow. And was it an instant success? Well, we had a hiccup, as you know. So you're on a road trip, you get a flat tire or you run out of petrol. So yeah, of course, that's going to happen on any journey. And this was no different. So um, we had booked trade show booth at, uh, at a trade show here in Southern California to showcase the product for the very first time in January, uh, Super Bowl weekend of January 1986. And in um, November our chemist came to us and said, and he was holding all the formulas because we hadn't paid him for any of them at that stage, but we had already turned them over to the manufacturer to make. They were, these were custom formulas. No one had these formulas mm -hmm. and still don't. All our formulas were our own. So he sat us down and said that he um, didn't believe we could be successful. He didn't believe we knew enough about the American market. He thought the product had a weird name, Dermalogica. No one can pronounce it. And he wanted to be paid out immediately. And in our, in our in Raymond's brilliance in, in business, um, he had pre-written the formula that we would pay him out for formulas. Mm. And it was much more than we could afford. It was, two, it was like $2,000 a formula. And uh, we had 27 formulas. We had no money, no spare cash, because we'd put everything into the marketing materials, the promotion materials, paying for the trade show booth, all the rest of it. And um, we, we, there's no way we could pay him. So we had to figure out a negotiation, which we did. And we, we got the negotiation down uh, to uh, $20,000. And for everything, we still didn't have the $20,000. So we spoke to a friend who was uh, doing pretty well in finance and we, we didn't even have credit cards or something. And we persuaded him to lend us the $20,000 until after Super Bowl weekend. Wow. And we were going to take, we were going to sell opening orders of the product at the trade show. And with those checks, we were going to pay him back the 20000 and fund the production of the first run. So the end of January 1986, we go to the trade show, three days trade show. We know we have to raise enough to cover this debt. So we had a $1,500 opening order, which is really cheeky because we didn't have any product. Um, we had testers, what we call bench samples, in packaging because we already had the packaging. And we persuaded the contract manufacturer to hand fill some testers for us because we couldn't afford to do a run. 
And we went to the trade show and we just, I, I wrote little post-it notes on the back of the counter, the booth, saying that we have to open 15 accounts in three days. We have to open 15 accounts in three days because it was a $1,500 opening order and we needed to pay back the 20,000. <laughs> so 15 in three days, 15 in three days. So I told everybody, so I believe in manifestation, 15 in three days. Everyone got that 15 in three days, 15 in three, 15 in three, 15 in three. Kept post-it notes. We didn't, I wrote it as 15 in three so that if anyone saw them, they wouldn't have a clue what that yeah. meant. And of course, I'd been teaching for three years by then and my students wanted to support me. They were my community. They were my posse. They named themselves my tribe. And they said, Jane, and the very first account we ever opened in the world with Dermalogica was Becky Sinclair. And she worked for Pizzazz in Bakersfield, California. And I said to Becky, when she handed me her check for $1,500, I said, Becky, I haven't even shown you the product yet. And she said, Jane, I want you to know that if you and Raymond are in, I'm in. And I said, I held the check and I said, Becky, I will never forget this. I will thank you forever, every time I get an opportunity. So Becky, I know you've retired now, but here's a <laughs> shout out. We opened 15 accounts in three hours. Wow. 15 in three, but it was three hours, not three days. And we did a million dollars in our first year. Oh my gosh. That made me very emotional because we were talking earlier before we started recording about the value of community and how mm -hmm. the cornerstone of Dermalogica is building this community. And the fact that people believed in you enough to buy without even seeing or testing the product, that's just such a testament to the community that you'd built from teaching for those three years before. Yeah, it was a testimony to the trust that they had placed in me and the fact that in every class I taught, and I taught Sunday through Fridays, every single week. Saturday was the day to do, um, you know, everything else. I did all the laundry in the laundry of my one bedroom apartment in the basement where the garage was, because we didn't have in, in built, you know, built in laundry or anything. And I told that my students knew that. And I would tell them, you know, put all your laundry there in the hamper because I'm taking it home. I'm doing it tonight. I would launder every night so that they had fresh towels and fresh sheets to put on the beds as I was teaching them practical, not just theory. And I would say to them, you know, um, listen, you're my family now. My family are all in the UK. You're my family. And they responded and, and you know, we, we built solid relationships. It wasn't just a teacher, student, and they would ask me, you know, are you coming to the Red Onion for drinks after class, Jane? I never did that because I would always <laughs> say, no, you're, you're my client. It's like my clients. You know, I never crossed that line. I'm old school like that. So, no, you go and have your drinks. You can talk about me all you want because, and, sh and don't forget you've got homework tonight because when tomorrow morning you better come in and you've learned that effleurage massage movement because you're doing practical <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. But we built solid relationships and that was over years. And so when they came to that trade show, they came with their checkbooks and it meant the world to me. And without them, without those, those skin therapists who supported us, and I literally can name them because they were my family and are my family, um, we would not have had our success. And I've never, Ray and I never forgot it. And we also have supported local skin therapists around the world. That was where we sold our product to. My mother taught me, you leave the party with the person that took you. They brought us to the party. And as long as I'm involved in the industry, that's the person I leave with, the skin therapist. Given that you, throughout your childhood and as a young adult, you had this struggle with money where there was never enough money, how did that moment where you made a million dollars on the dermatological products in such a short amount of time. How did that feel to you? Ray and I always knew, we always talked about this idea that the product Dermalogica was going to be our vehicle. And not only our vehicle, it had to make the skin therapist we were selling it to more successful. Because if it didn't, we weren't going to do well. So our mission statement in the very beginning, it's still true today it was one sentence it was 
what we want to do is we want to define, bring respect and success to professional skin therapists through excellent education, innovative product, and outstanding human connection. And we used to say outstanding customer service, but we rewrote that ourselves be, sometime later because we realized it's actually we're all in customer service. The person that's greeting them, the person that's our janitorial team, we're all about it's outstanding human connection. And that's what skin therapists do as well. And so we knew to define them. We have to teach treatments that are going to bring them definition in the work it's not about makeup it's not about beauty it's about skin health and wellness and I mean to my knowledge only Horst Reckelbacher who started Aveda and us were saying the word wellness in the 80s but that's what we felt about it and I had conversations with Horst about that and and it it's about health and wellness rather than illness you know now I think that word has been kind of hijacked a bit and it feels a bit elite which I'm sorry that happened because Horst and I literally, you know, we started self-funded and all of us were very frugal. But this idea that it had to bring respect to the skin therapist, no gimmicks. We weren't going to launch gimmicky products. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to launch an instant limp pl lip plumper or anything. I'm not launching miracle wrinkle creams. They don't exist. I'm not going to pretend they do. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is we're going to define and bring respect to skin therapist and we're going to make them successful. And we're going to do that by making sure they are the most highly skilled they can be. They have the best products in their hands, literally. And that we never undermine that credibility for our own short-term gain. So the million dollars in the first year was great. And we knew we had to put it back into the business to keep going. It wasn't mm. a short-term gain. We weren't looking to build it and flip it. Lots of entrepreneurs do that. I, I call them, you know, serial entrepreneurs. They'll build and flip, build and flip, build and flip, because what they do really well is start a business, but not necessarily run a business. We were in it for the long-term goal. We did not want to flip Dermalogica. We wanted to build it. We wanted to change the industry. We wanted to bring success to those skin therapists. I am maniacal about financial independence, especially for women, immigrants, underserved communities, women of color who get less than 1% of all funding. And the reason I'm maniacal about it is because it's not about the money. It's not because financial independence means, oh, you've got money. It's about choices, options, and opportunity. To us, the money meant and still does mean choices, options and opportunity it's not about static wealth it's about what does that allow you to now do and that became our purpose was making these salons successful and we did and because they were we were very successful mm -hmm. and it was a partnership and we would repeat that to them all the time and I would say they would laugh at me and I'd say listen I'm going to drag you kicking, screaming, and biting if necessary to your optimum level of success. Because trust me, if you are not outrageously successful in your business, we're not successful in our business. And trust me, we have no plan B. We have to be successful. And that resonated. And we were in it together. We were going over the hill together. If we fell on our face, they were going to fall on their face. If they didn't do well, we weren't going to do well. And that became the thread that built the whole brand. It's, do I think it's because our cleansers are better than anybody else's? Yeah, you'll expect me to say that. I'm the <laughs> founder. But it's not just about that. There are lots of good cleansers out there. It was about what that enabled us to do as an industry. That was much, much stronger. That was our purpose. I think it's fascinating that you've used this word, the concept of financial independence, so many times because that is something... I strive to achieve. That's something my audience strives mm -hmm. to achieve. Mm -hmm. When did you feel like you had hit the financial independence and how did that shift your way of thinking? Well, listen, I, I remember saying to Raymond, you know, back in the day, if we do, if we ever do $10 million, like in one year, 
that's it. Like, that's it, right? I mean, if we can't survive on 10, you know, not that you've, you've got $10 million, but if you turn over, you do $10 million top line turnover, and we were selling at wholesale to sell. So our top line turnover was, was what the wholesale price was. If we can do that, we, we will not be able, we don't have to worry about them paying rent because we had a high, you know, we d- did a, a high uh, profit margin. We had a good gross profit that we would need to invest in the brand, et cetera, et cetera. So the model was right. And we had cash flow because we were working in a COD business with small salons. We never sold to the big ones who wanted 120 days credit. That would have mm-hmm. taken us under. We, the UPS man went in with the product box, got the check and left the product there and brought the check to us. That was how it worked. So when we did a million dollars in our first year, our goal was, oh my gosh, okay, so in 10 years time, maybe we could do, we'll be doing $10 million in a year. It happened before 10 years time. It happened within about six years time. And that was it. So when you say what what time, that was it. So um, 1992, I decided it's, <laughs> we're okay. Whew, we'll be able to pay rent. We'll be able to feed ourselves. We bought our first house. It was $300,000 um, suburban house in Venice here in California. That was it. And... Uh, I did, then, I, then we didn't worry. Then the rest was uh, was fantastic, of course, and we knew that with that kind of success comes responsibility. Mm-hmm. You must pay it forward. I, I I feel very strongly about purpose and this idea of options, choices, and opportunities. Um, we set up a foundation, nonprofit foundation, completely separate to Dermalogica, and uh, we focus now on. I am still involved with Dermalogica, but uh, um, our focus in the nonprofit way is to fund, coach, train, support local businesses and and, uh, local entrepreneurs. That's who brought us to the party. And without that financial independence, they won't survive. And without them, we don't have a community. Without your small business, you don't have a neighborhood that you live in. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live next door to the Amazon warehouse. I want to be able to go to my shoe repair up in in San Vicente Boulevard. I want to go into farm shop and talk to Greg, the manager. I want to be able to go into, you know, the local post office and speak to the two people that work behind that on 26th Street. That's that's my community. How did how did your mom react when she saw the financial success you were having? Oh, my mom. I miss her every day. My mom said to me now. (laughs) I'm very proud of you and never forget who you are. This is her words exactly. You have a very lovely nature and don't let this spoil you. And I said, I'm going to try really hard for it not to, mum. I know who I am. I'm I'm your daughter and... uh, that, you never get you never get ahead of your skates. You never you know get too big for your boots. The minute it happens and your ego starts to to rule, I think it's the kiss of death, quite honestly, to your success. Because, I, I mean, I guess you can go on and be successful, but it's not going to have the same resonance, and mm-hmm. it's not going to give you that high in my in my <clears throat> in my belief, that high of feeling I'm living my purpose. And I think if you're not experiencing that high organically yourself within your soul and your spirit, you start to seek the high somewhere else, you know, and, and whether it's, you know, you, you need that dopamine rush. So whether, you know, it's buying, I don't know what you would buy, but, you know, a, a Maserati or a, you know, Rolls Royce or a plane or something, you know, or whether you think I've got, you know, I've got to, you know, get the very, very latest of everything or whether you think I'm going to gamble or whether you turn to, you know, to drink, drugs, whatever, you know, I don't know what it could be, fill in the blank <laughs> um, of whatever it might be um, that to give you your rush, that is now going to take you down a path that isn't going to be the one you probably originally intended. And it's so amazing because you are, from the conversation we had before we started recording, it's really nice and refreshing to find someone who has had so much success and manages to stay humble because I think it's hard. The, f- the more success you find and the more years have passed since you can remember those early days of having to coupon and budget, it, it's, it's easy to get sucked into 
this new reality. Oh yeah, is. it's seductive. Mm -hmm. It's very seductive. And, and if we think, oh, our worth, our relevance is to do with those external things, it's not only seductive, it's, um, it kidnaps you in a, in a way. I've seen it happen. I'm sure you have too. You've, you've had a background in, in, you know, the very high powered legal background that you chose to, you chose an alternate route. I've seen it with people that I've admired and, and I know have uh, really good hearts and the right background, but they lost their way somewhere. And, uh, and it never changed them, but they were changed by, by it. And I know mm -hmm. that sounds contradictory, but there is something about really digging into your own personal bigger why. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? What is the bigger reason? When I say the why, and I write about this in my book, Skin in the Game, for me, your why is what is it you are doing every day that doesn't just benefit you, but benefits at least one other person? And there's lots of things that could be doing. You could be parenting and and you're benefiting your family which is an amazing thing we need we need all of this we need all of the above there isn't anything that's that should be seen as bigger than the rest or more important than the rest we're all here just trying to do our thing trying to make a difference and I believe that every one of us has every single thing we need to do that already inside us and you just have to be vulnerable enough, open enough, honest enough with yourself to say, well, what is it that I can do? And never, ever trivialize that. Never say, well, just because I can wax a bikini line in seven minutes, that's not nearly as important as this person who's, you know, trying to develop the, the next, you know, vaccine for a pandemic. It's different. And I know that by touching someone in a kind and nurturing way in a professional salon environment, it changes the way they feel about themselves. And that may seem very, very tiny, but it is equally as important to that one person. And I just use that dramatic illustration to say, when you dig in and you're very honest with why you're doing what you're doing and why you do it, for me, it's never been about beauty. It's always been about human connection. And once you internalize that and that becomes your, your, really your value system, it's very hard to shake a person from it. But if we're not digging in deep to find our why and we're really concentrating on our what I do and how I do it and who I do it with rather than why, you just get lost in the people, places and things the how, the what, the who, mm -hmm. the where, you get all seduced by where I'm doing it, who I know, how I do it, much bigger than why do I do it. Yeah. For me, it's taken me a long time to figure this out. Trust me, it's not like I was saying any of this when I was in my teens. Uh, I, uh, but the one true north for me that has sustained me is just always remembering the fixed points of where did I come from? That could not have been an accident. I was meant to have that upbringing. And some of us had horrific upbringings, but I, I can't explain the why of that other than to say that must inform us of why we're here and where we're going. You know, there's, there's a the security expert, Gavin De Becker, who's extremely successful in providing security for people and he wrote a book many years ago called and I believe it's I've got it right but it could be something but the gift of fear and Gavin De Becker grew up in a brutally violent home had a brutally abusive violent childhood to the degree that he explains he became almost feral in how he could read the room he knew when someone was 
threat was about to threaten him or hurt him or harm him or that person over there he could read the room and the mood and the energy and he could feel it shift even subtly because quite literally his life depended on him being able to navigate mm. through this toxic childhood and that became his strength in understanding he knows how to develop security because for others because he can spot where the insecurity is where the weakness is where the vulnerability is where the gap in the security system is and he is arguably one of the most famous security experts in the world and has trained teams around the world whether they are securing celebrities or securing royalty or securing olympic events he says it all came from learning that feral ability to understand what danger really looked like. And it doesn't always look like you expect it to. And I think that's really true. So if we believe where we've come from is purpose built for where we're meant to be going, that's already going to give us our first point and maybe help us navigate how we could get to that goal. In building Dermalogica, what were the, some of the hardest points you went through, some of the lows, and how did where you came from help you to get through those? Well, as crazy as it does sound, probably, I always knew I could work. So the worst thing happened, okay, Ray and I would say, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, the worst thing is, you know, the business is not successful. People suddenly decide, I don't like this product, I don't like you, and I want you to go home. <laughs> so I'd, I'd fabricate these crazy kind of ideas. It was the same thing that I used to think about as in my first days as a skin therapist. I was so nervous to go up to a new client who I hadn't worked on before. And I would say to myself, as I literally hid in the, in the staff room of the salon and peeked out to see who was in the reception area, was this my, cli my client? I would say, okay, Jane, listen, you're going to go out there, you're going to step forward, extend your hand, and you're going to say, good morning, Mrs. whoever it was, their name, because we never call clients by their first name. My name is Jane, and I'm really looking forward to taking care of your skin today. And I'd say, no, 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 I can't do it. I can't do it. This is me, my inner voice. And then I'd say, Jane, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to go out there. You're going to extend your hand. They're not going to shake your hand. They're going to look at you up and down and they're going to say, I'm sorry, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but I have no interest in anything you're saying. Go away. That's like the worst thing. <laughs> they're not going to assault you because they'll be arrested. So they, But they could say something really incredibly mean. So what will you say if they say that? And I'd say, well, thank you very much for the opportunity and turn around with hot tears stinging the backs of your eyes, just walk very, very slowly and carefully back to the staff room where you can collapse in tears. <laughs> this was my quick. And I will, I promise you, Erica, no one ever said that to me. So I became emboldened with this idea. I'm just going to go for it. What's the worst thing that can happen? So from that, I basically always said, Raymond, the same, whatever happens at Dermalogica, what's the worst thing that can happen? And Ray said, He'll get a job, at, you know, flipping burgers. It doesn't matter. Doing janitorial work at night in a hospital. We can find a job. And I always said, well, I, you know, my, my go-to, I can write some bikini line in seven minutes. I know how to extract a comedone, a blackhead from somebody's ear. Not an easy skill that everybody knows. I can give a really great skin treatment. I can massage people's feet until they fall asleep in the chair. I can earn money from that. If I have to do seated massage on Venice Beach on a Sunday, I figure I could make enough to eat. So this was it. So that got us through SARS epidemic where our Asian business closed down and our biggest market then was Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, that all shut down during SARS. So that was, your, but however... We were strong in the US and we knew that could support our business. It got us through the recession of 2008 where we lost 1,500 out of 6,000 salons that we had. 
because they just couldn't weather. You know, it wasn't that retail slowed down in October of 2008. It literally fell off the cliff. And by January, we had salons that were in dire straits. And we knew that they would be back when they recovered. So we tried really hard to place them in salons that were still working. We took back product that they couldn't sell, that they still had on their shelves. We promised them we would be there for them. We gave consignment product. We extended credit terms, which we'd never done before. We didn't lay off one person at Dermalogica. Ray and I stood up in front of our team and we said, we will stop taking salary ourselves before we cut your salary. We will cut programs before we cut people. That was our mantra. And we made it through because we didn't lose staff. And they it cemented our, our loyalty to them and them to us. And so when hard things happened, we just always believed we would make it through and kind of go down trying. And when hard things in business come, you, you know, you're going to figure it out. I mean, the, uh, business is always going to have bumps, but there's always going to be issues where you have you know there's a formula that's a product there's a cap that doesn't fit a bottle you ordered a pump from germany and it came in and it was the wrong size for the product that you figure it out these aren't these are not big problems these are problems you can solve big problems look completely different those are life-changing illnesses your family you know something in your fact these those are the huge problems the rest of it you can figure out. And with a good team, you can figure it out pretty well. What was your relationship like with your husband, Raymond? And how, what did he teach you in this journey? I'm smiling because um, Raymond, first of all, is the smartest person I've ever met in my life. And I've met a lot of people in my life. And many of them are very, very smart. But Raymond has the... Um, I, unbelievable ability and I'm kind of saying unbelievable because I've never met anyone else that has it he is a complete truth teller I mean sometimes I wish he wasn't sometimes <laughs> I wish he would kind of soften it a little bit for me but he has no ability to edit so he will say exactly what is on his mind and sometimes I go I say you know ouch it's a good job I know you well enough to you know it's so and in business, the same. I've known, bus I've known Raymond for well over 40 years. I um, have never known him to tell a lie or even a mistruth in any professional relationship or a personal relationship. He doesn't know how to. It wouldn't occur to him. And so consequently, um, he is completely down to earth. He's a pragmatist. We could argue, and we did, and anyone listening to this who ever worked for Dermalogica, you know that we would call it a fierce conversation. It was not an argument. It was a fierce conversation. He and I would argue in front of the team for our positions. I would say this product is we have to spend on the formulation. The product and the ingredients cannot be cut. And he would say we have to market it differently. And I'd say, it's not, I'm protecting the formulation. He would say, I'm protecting the marketing position. I'd say, okay, well then let's hammer it out because we're going to have to reach a compromise. And we would, we'd say, okay, you know what? We're not doing any print advertising. We're not going to, we're going to lower our cost of doing business by doing that. We're going to put everything into events inside the salons. We're going to talk to the 600 clients that salon has rather than the 60,000 people that read one page of Vogue and it cost us 95,000 to actually do that ad. So, you know, we, we would fight it out, hammer it out, no matter how small or big. And it was pretty ferocious and fierce. But we knew at the end of the day, we wanted the same thing. We wanted to be unreasonably successful and for our salons to be as well. So we had the same value system. We were completely aligned. Our journey to get there, it was like the journey from Vegas to LA. It could be on a plane, it could be on a train, you might walk there, different way of getting there, but we would arrive at the same destination. And we were in business together for 10 years before we married. Oh. We married in 1990 and we've been together since 1980. And so when we got married, we knew exactly who we were marrying. And uh, it was the right decision. And we waited to have children. And all of these are the decisions we had to make together. And you have to 
talk about these things because I was traveling every six weeks. I was doing international travel. So I had Molly when I was 36 and I had Lucy when I was 41. And I just felt really, really grateful that I had the opportunity to have a family as well as a business. And Raymond could not have been successful without me. I could not have been successful without him. And so together we sort of completed a two halves of a whole that somehow figured it out. One of the, my husband and I, we, we had a little argument in the car yesterday. And <laughs> a little argument? A little, a huge one in the a car. A little argument, maybe a huge one. And it's tough because we've gone from having completely separate jobs. He worked in finance, I worked in law. And we'd see each other maybe at seven or eight after work to now having a company together. Yeah. And especially in this first year of figuring out his work style within the company, my work style, yeah. it's quite difficult. There is some clashing. Yes. And one of my things is I also am a truth teller. I don't know how to sugarcoat things. Yep. And even if I knew how to sugarcoat things, I don't think I would because it takes extra words to do that. That's right. And so that's one of his big complaints about me is like, I wish you could just sugarcoat it a little. But how... And one of the things we're going to try to improve now is separating marriage time and the quality or the time we spend to build our relationship and go on dates to business and work time. Did you feel like you had that kind of separation? Did you have a certain hour at which you would say no more talking about work? No, absolutely not. I re- no, we loved what we did. We loved our work. We were passionate about it. I, I you know. I, I, we never figured out. Maybe it's different if you work for someone else. You know, maybe, actually, I think it is because I'm just thinking back. When when I worked in a salon, I didn't necessarily, you know, I never discussed my clients with anyone else, but I didn't discuss, I didn't necessarily take that those problems back home with me. I probably could have done it then. However, when it's your business, it's like saying we're never going to discuss the kids when we're on when we're out to dinner together. I mean, forget it. You're going to, of course you're going to, if there's a problem. Now, how are you not going to do that? So Ray and I never even attempted to separate business from work because we loved each other. We loved our relationship and we loved the business. So we would drive home together. You know, we, we didn't always like carpool, but occasionally we would um, because I started later than him. He wanted to get into the office first thing. He got in at 7, 7.15. It infuriated him that I would come in at 8.30, 9 o'clock. My classes used to start at 10. I didn't care that it infuriated me. He'd say, Jane, I can't believe you could rock up this time. You know, this time. There are people that have been in here since 8.30. I said, yes, and those people will leave at 5.30 and I'm happy for them. I'll be here at 8.30. So it's okay. We do it differently. So we just ultimately wore each other out with saying, that was it. Now, if it was a trade show, you bet I was going to be there at the same time as him. We walked in together. But, you know, we just had to figure that that out. What were the big problems? What were the little problems? Tons of stuff irritated us about each other and still does. But we realized it's not enough to be a deal breaker. Mm. It's just not enough to be a deal breaker. So we um, we would talk about the caps not fitting the bottles when we got home. We would sit at home and discuss the P&L. We would sit at home and discuss whether that air freight ordered to Australia because they hadn't received their ship freight, you know, their ship freight, which took six weeks and that was stuck in a docks in, in Sydney. Uh, could we afford to air freight? If we could, how could we know? Would it be cheaper to air freight from the warehouse that our distributor had in Malaysia? That we couldn't just say, oh, sorry. It's 6.30. No more talking about that. Now let's, you know, what should we talk about? (laughs) The air freight from Malaysia. Is that cheaper? We never managed to do it. So, and we made it through. And is there a a secret to that? I don't know. Just, um, well, actually, maybe there is. We we agreed, no matter what, we we were going to figure it out. No matter what. It literally, um, we were not going to give up uh, on each other, and we were. It was going to be easier to give up, easier to bail, easier to walk. That first year, you talk about the first year. Yeah, definitely. There were there was. I I'm thinking of what Ray will kill me if he hears this. But there was one thing where we had an enormous argument, and it was in December. And I I said I'm going. I'm leaving. I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to find my own apartment. I can do this. I can work in a salon. I'm gone. Do you realize that I can do? Yep. Anyway, and I I he said where are you going? And I said I'm I'm going shopping. I'm going 
to Macy's. And I literally drove to the Macy's in Santa Monica. And I was li- I was in the cosmetic department because I love to just look at what the competition's doing. And Ray walked in to, to Macy's. And I said, what are you doing here? And he, said, and he knew where I would be. And he said, you're coming home. We're going to figure this out. And I wanted to. So I did. And we made an agreement there in our one-bedroom apartment that we didn't just quit and walk out. Barring, of course, there being a problem that was insurmountable because of, you know, violence or or mistrust or or whatever that might be. But we were not going to walk out because we didn't agree with who should be folding the laundry. That was if that was big enough to break us, then we really didn't have a relationship. And I don't know, listen, it worked for us. It doesn't mean it's a a solution for everyone. But once we had agreed that, weirdly, we kind of held each other to it. And and we still do. Wow. We need to take that advice. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, listen, you figure it's figuring out the journey. You're still figuring it out. First year, you know, whatever. It's we we took 10 years until we were pretty sure we could make it in a personal relationship as well as a professional relationship was not easy by any means. However, I now look back and I can say those all were growth moments and, and I feel really fortunate and grateful that we were able to push through it. So once you made that decision that you were going to be aligned together no matter what, how did you go about figuring out what your end goal was, what you two wanted to build together and how you were going to get there. Okay, so uh, when we started the company, I was, so 1983 was the International Dermal Institute. So I was 26, Ray was 35, he's nine years older than me. So starting from from there, let's take it from there. We didn't know what the end goal was gonna be. We knew that what we were loving what we were doing. We were having fun with what we were doing. We were working bloody hard, but we were loving it. And it felt like we were getting traction. We could feel it. You know, we could just feel it was happening. So we didn't quite know where it was going, but we knew we were on the right train. So we used to say, we're on the right train, heading in the right direction. No idea where we're getting off or where this train journey ends. However, it's going great. We're having fun. We're loving it. Keep doing it. So our goal was quite simply keep the wheels on the vehicle, keep keep building a really strong team, build a team with value systems, different skills than us, but value systems that matched. And that was really important. When we would interview people from other companies, you know, as we were growing, we would say things to them that really illustrated you are not going to have a those days secretary you're going to be expected to do your own business you you are going to be expected to clean up we all clean the restrooms we all make the tea whatever it is so don't it's all very well to say oh i love joining a startup because we were a startup then but be very careful what you wish for because there is no hierarchy here we don't have a parking space we don't have an executive bathroom we will, Raymond will be the first in, I will be the last out. Between us, it will be seven in the morning till 8.30 at night. And we expect the team to, to pull their weight, not to all do the same, but mm-hmm. to do the best you can. So in, in defining that, we were going to just keep doing it as long as it was fun. We, we continued. We had no exit plan. And this is a kind of a funny story. People who were used to a corporate world in America would say to us, what is your exit strategy? And I'm not joking when I say neither Raymond nor I knew what that phrase meant. So one time in the elevator in Century City, coming down from one of those, you know, legal offices, (laughs) Ray said to me, what do they mean when they say exit strategy? And I said, I don't know. I guess it's like when you die. So Ray said, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I said, well, I want to be cremated. (laughs) And Ray said, well, I want to be buried. I said, okay, well, as long as we know that, I guess that's important. And I'm not kidding. When people would say for a little while after that exit strategy, I'd say, well, I know I want to be cremated (laughs) and Ray wants to be buried. And they laugh. And I didn't think that was particularly funny. (laughs) But anyway, and then, of course, we learned what it meant. It means how are you going to end your business? How are you going to exit the business? 
We thought that was a funny thing. How can you be thinking about it now? We are, we've got a tiger by the tail. How do we exit the business? We're not, we're, not, we're playing a long game. So it's kind of back to, are you playing a short game? In which case, you're going to flip it in two years. You're going to say, well, the minute it slows down in this area, that's the red flag. We're bailing. And we'll start another one. I guess that's the way to do it. That wasn't us. Our value system who was always playing a long game in the relationship, in the business. Our why was to change the industry, to professionalize it, to bring respect and success to professional skin therapists. I couldn't bail on that. What was I going to do? I, I was always going to do that. And I didn't want to do it for someone else. I'd rather do it for myself. And our business was successful. I was living my why. And Raymond, if Raymond had said to me, look, listen, my, my goal is to make a bunch of money and get out. And I'd said, well, I'm in it for the long haul. We would have had opposing value systems and that would have definitely fractured the business because he would have wanted money and get out or I would have wanted money and get out and he would have wanted in. That's like someone wanting to stay in the marriage and someone wanting out. One way or the other, someone's not happy and that is going to fracture the marriage. So we wanted... We didn't know where we were going, but we were having fun doing what we loved. We felt it was purpose-driven. We, we felt highly gratified by what we were doing. We weren't embarrassed about what we were doing. We weren't doing anything illegal. We were paying all our taxes. We were living in America. We were in California. Oh, my gosh, can you believe this? We live in Los Angeles. We bought our own house for $300,000. Uh, we, can, we can afford to fly home. Never mind business or for we didn't fly business class until after we <laughs> sold the company and that's a true story really absolutely and even after we sold the company and we did not do an earn out we got a full payout but we stayed in because they wanted us to and we wanted to we were having we said as long as we're having fun we're in the minute we're not we're out even then if one of the team if we were traveling with one of the team and it was coach we were in coach we we ran with the with the posse, we run together, we hug together. That was just our value system. So when we had, then we, we just got older. So here are our options. What are we going to do? We're playing a long game. Now it's long. Now I'm in my 50s and raised in his 60s. Wow, that went fast. Now we're married and we have two kids. And we said, well, what are, you know, what's our exit strategy? What are, we gonna, what are we doing here? Are we still having fun? We check in with each other every so often. Yeah, loving it. Are people still liking what we're doing? Yeah. Are people still successful because of what we're doing? Yeah. Have we compromised ourselves in any way? Not yet. Are we making a good living? Yes. We still, we live in the same house. Right now, I live in the same house we bought before our second child was born. When, when Molly was two years old, we bought this house. We, it, it, we've never, that's, that's us. That's who we are. Now, so th there we go forward. So then we get to the stage where Ray said to me, and he was in his 60s, he said to me, you know what? I think I'm, I'm getting ready. I said, okay, I'm not ready yet. Give me a couple of years. And sure enough, we knew. And we said, when we know, we're going to know. Now, what made us know? We weren't having as much fun. We, ha we had a big company. We had... 1,500 people that worked for us. We were in 106 countries. And Steve Kurland, who was kind of like our, our number two to both of us, he ran international and all our big markets, and we've been friends for years, godfather to both our kids. He said to us, you know what, guys? We can keep doing it, but at this stage, we're, we're literally going to keep doing what we've already done. We're going to have fantastic trips. We're going to go to amazing countries with people that we know. And yet, digital's coming up. The world is changing. The business is changing, as it should. We have to know when you're running a relay race, you're the first runner. When is it time to pass the baton? We didn't need investment. We never took outside investment ever. We never gave equity. When we sold, we owned it 100% debt-free. Never had any debt. Wow. Right. So we didn't need a partner. We don't play well in the sandbox. So we didn't, people said, go to an IPO. We could have done it. We were certainly profitable enough. 
We didn't want to because if I don't want to report to one person, I don't want to report to shareholders. That was not who Raymond and I were. No, that's not it. So then we thought, would it be a legacy business? We've got two children. Would Molly and Lucy run the business? We decided when they were very small, before they were born, if we ever have kids, unless they are just gung-ho, I want to work and run a skincare business, we're not going to make them come into the business. And if they do want to come into Dermalogica, they're going to start from the bottom up. They can't walk into the C-suite. That, that is setting them up for failure. I wouldn't have respected anybody that got their job that way. And even if they're brilliant, they've got the same last name as us. Everyone's going to say, well, pff, yeah, you know how they got that job. I don't want that for our kids. So when we were raising our children, we told them, you've got to find your own purpose. And they have. Our eldest daughter is a, a successful artist, avant-garde. Not art that we would necessarily have ever created ourselves, but it's brilliant and we admire it and we love them and they are living their most authentic life. And the one thing we have always said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Oscar Wilde said that. We repeated it. You have to find who you are. You are here for a reason. And, and Molly is an incredible person and uh, is fully authentic. And only when you're fully authentic will you find your true purpose. It's the caveat. You have to take the big leap and say, this is who I am. I'm owning it. And until you, and when you do that, I don't know that you will ever find your authentic self. And if you don't find your authentic self, you'll never find why you were here. And I don't know. I think this is the only life we're going to get. Or it's the only one we remember, right? Lucy works in the nonprofit space. She studied criminal justice, wanted to be in the FBI. She's living on the East Coast in Baltimore and, and is working for a nonprofit, living classrooms, and very, very happy. Neither of them are in the business. So once we knew that about our kids and about ourselves, quite honestly, as soon as they had graduated high school, which would have been when we were tied into L.A., um, we felt that was it. It was time for an acquisition. It was a sale. And that we realized our exit strategy probably five years before we exited. We didn't know until then. We were on a road trip. We were on a road trip, and it was only when we caught sight of the skyscrapers that we said, oh, my gosh, we ended up on the other side of the country. We're in Manhattan. We knew we were going to drive as hard as we could for as long as we could until we ran out of gas. And that was where we were going to be. And thank goodness we, we ended up in a good place. So to bring this full circle, in 2015, you ended up selling to Unilever. The acquisition price wasn't disclosed, but we know that the year prior, you had done $500 million in sales at retail. Correct. What was that feeling like? Euphoric euphoric for several reasons first of all the five years prior were the worst years in our career not because the business wasn't doing well business was doing great we were struggling with the decision we were struggling with taking that leap once you sell this is it this was the only company we were ever going to sell and the only company we're ever going to have we're not going to do it again people have said to me don't you want to start another skincare business are you crazy I could never replicate what I did with Dermalogica. It wasn't about the product. It was about the journey. So no, I've done that. I don't need to keep doing that again. No, I want to do other things. I'm in my third act. Third act of the play, you find out what it all meant, who the characters were and why they were in the play. I want to live my third act. I don't want to repeat the second act. So the five years was dreadful. Once we had made the decision, it is a sale. It is an acquisition. Whew, that was a relief. Now it got exciting. Now it got now we got excited again. Cuz we went to meet with a bank. You first the first thing you do when you go to an acquisition, you the first people you choose, your attorneys. Your attorneys, you're going to pay a lot of money to them and they're worth every single cent. You think the bank is worth it? They're important, but the attorneys are the ones that are going to make sure you get through unscathed. We use Scadnops. Brian McCarthy was our lead person. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Scadnops. We could have not have done it without you and the amazing team you had that worked through the night. And you know that from the yes, other side. Yes, I was Erica. the one working through the night. <laughs> exactly. So 
there we are. So we, once we had our, our SCAD NARPs in place, we knew they were our conciliary. They were literally advising us. We then got the bank involved and we went with Mullis, Ken Mullis. Mm-hmm. We, we met with here in LA. We went with LA because LA brought us to the party. And once we had that in place, they advised us. They told us, you've got to do a book. You've got to do a book where you talk about the company. Don't mention the company. You're going to build it out. And that's what we're going to take out and sell. And Ray and I went down in the elevator from Muller's office and Ray said to me, what do you think of the book? And I said, dreadful. He said, we're never going to do it. I said, never. He said, we're never going to write down. This is all in the elevator ride to the ground floor. We're never going to write down everything about the company. I said, forget it. He said, okay, we've got, all right, so we've got to figure out what else we're going to do. That was on a Friday. Monday morning, we called them in together and we said, we're not doing a book. And they said, no, we have to do a book because no one else is, no one's going to know that you're for sale. And I said, no, we're going to do it differently. We're going to do it entrepreneurially. And I said to Ken and Brian, we're going to do a whisper campaign. And they said, what's that? What? No, 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 no. And I said, no, we're going to. Here's what's going to happen. We don't need to go out and look for people. We know who the people are going to want to buy us because the size we are, we know they've all tried to approach us in the past. Here are the eight suspects. Each of these eight, we don't know enough about any of them to say which is the one we want, but these are the eight that could feasibly be it. So we gave them the names and they said, okay, all right, what about this one? And it was someone else. We go, no, 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 they can't do it. They're, they're, they're in problems. They're not going to be big enough or whatever it would. We knew the market. So we'd, we lived our lives in it. So we said, each of these eight has a CEO, not the M&A people, CEO. We need to figure out who knows someone there that can get a whisper, not that we are ready to sell, but that, you know, I hear the Whirlwinds are thinking, thinking about a move. I don't know what it is, but thinking about it. That's it. That's all we have to do. Because the ones who are really waiting to hear that, they've been waiting to hear it, they will, they will come in. We'll never have to do a book. And they said, it's unconventional, but I will tell you, Ken Willis got, got excited about it. He said, whoa. And he knew two of the, he said, I know two. And I said, okay, then you get them. You're it, Ken. You get to do it. <laughs> so it was like a chase. It was so exciting. We all got excited. That's how we did it. And within two weeks, we had six approaches. Oh my goodness. Two said they would be interested, but there were other things going on. And that later came to pass. It was, it was not divulged at the time, but they were making different moves in their businesses. Six came back. We then said, okay, here's the thing. Six, those six, Ray and I want to have dinner with the CEO. Not the M&A people. We know that we're not ready to talk M&A. M&A is mergers and acquisitions. You know that, Erica, yes. but just we want to meet with the CEO because we're looking for one thing, value system. We know they can all do it. We know they can, they're all successful. They're all great. These are the leaders. These are all the names you'd know. But we want an aligned value system. We had dinner with each of them. One we had a breakfast with and one we had a brown bag lunch with. But we met each of the CEOs. And honestly, Erica, it revealed everything. Wow. Everything. Fantastic companies, all of them. Brilliant. We would have been honored and were honored to even be approached by them. It was a bidding war, which is what everyone, I guess, wants. But for us, it wasn't just about the bidding. It was about the value system. We got it down to two in the end, that there were two that we felt we could have a home with. One said, we want to fly you first class to New York. We want to take you out to dinner. We're sending a limo to your hotel. <laughs> we're taking you out to wine and dine you uh, for this special dinner. So we said, okay. And this was our other caveat. They have to choose where we're going for dinner. We went to a gorgeous restaurant very expensive. It was a tasting menu. It, you can't believe it. It was fantastic. And the first question asked of us at the dinner table, after the pleasantries, was how quickly can we end the distributor contracts? 
because we have distribution in every one of the countries that you distribute in and we can do it ourselves. And that told us a lot. The successful suitor was Unilever. Paul, and to give you the contrast, not that one's better and one's worse, it's just different. Paul Polman uh, took an Uber on his own from LAX to our offices in Carson. He got out of the Uber. He walked in to the building. I greeted him at the door. The first thing he said to me was, Jane, I'm a little obsessed with fight. Fight was F-I-T-E, financial independence through entrepreneurship. It was our nonprofit initiative. Wow. And I said, oh, I'm really pleased to hear that, Paul, because I'm a little obsessed with it too. Long story short, I showed him around the building. Of course, we didn't, no one knew we were selling, so no one knew who he was. And when we got into the classroom, some of our teachers were teaching, of course, a class. And Paul wanted to stand in and see the class for a little while. When the class wrapped for a break, he introduced him, not himself, but he introduced, uh, hi, I'm Paul, and uh, spoke to our teachers, asked how long they worked for the company. I was there. They both worked for us for well over 10 years. I asked them why they stayed in the company. They told him, I like that. We then walked through. We got a brown bag lunch off the lunch truck that called at the warehouse. <laughs> and we discussed our families. We discussed our um, belief systems, our value systems. And when I walked Paul out, we never discussed numbers. He already knew the numbers. He already knew. They'd done 10 years of research on us before he walked in. We shook hands at the door. We put him back in an Uber to go back to LAX to fly out. And the last thing he said was, I hope we can continue the conversation. And Ray and I said, I think we will. And that was it. Not only was it a compelling financial offer, of course, but he also wrote into the bid, which was handwritten, hand signed by him, which Skadnops told us they'd never seen that before because it was taking full responsibility for the offer. He promised to create 5 million jobs for women in their supply chain. Wow. And that was it. What's your advice for People are going to watch this podcast and listen to these values that you have. And one of the core ones is this financial independence concept of it. A lot of people want to achieve financial independence. If you were to talk to a 20-year-old and give their, your best advice on how they can achieve that and strive for that, what would you say to them? First of all, financial independence doesn't mean uh, uber wealthy, you're selling in a yacht, unless for you that's what that means. So understand when, when we say financial independence, what it means is you are self-sufficient. You can at least support yourself. You can pay for a roof over your head. You can put food on the table. You can live a life of purpose and you do not have to worry about doing another person's bidding for money. That's it. Now, you get to define how you, how big you want to live that, how, where you want to live that, with whom you want to live that. But I, this idea of a self-purpose, a self-determination is really at the root of it. It can be extremely extremely humble in some people's opinion. It could be very big in other people's opinion. You get to decide it's you. This is your life. You own it. That's a huge responsibility. You know, much easier to blame others. Well, I never got to do that because of this. I never got it. Never got it. Don't, don't blame others because if you do, you just handed responsibility for your life to another person. Take the responsibility yourself. So I say, first of all, self-determination. Secondly, be, have courage. Courage is not about being brave. Bravery is being able to have courage in the face of being terrified. None of us are just born brave. Oh, I don't care. I'm so risk aversive. What? Then you're crazy. It's about can you do it when you are frightened to death? Can you go up over the hill into battle, whatever that might be? That's where we have to steal ourselves. And people will sometimes say, you know, I'm really scared to do that. Well, yes, I understand. And you may choose not to. So that's okay. I'm never going to bungee jump. 
I'm never jumping off. I'm never going to bungee jump. You'd have to knock me unconscious and throw me off in a bungee jump to see my body going down in a bungee jump. Other people do it all the time. I have no idea how they do it. But if you, because to me, that's life changing. I could break my neck. But a business decision that, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hopefully you're not going to die from it, but I can, I can make a decision on that. So we all have our element of risk. So I think a life of self-determination, whatever that looks like, that's what I wish for you to never have to live your life on someone else's determination. Never shrink yourself. Never think that what I do is too small to really make me successful. I wax bikini lines. That led to my confidence in myself. (laughs) It can be small and it can be big. And on the concept of money, I want to tell a little story that I know my audience would love. So you had obviously this this big successful exit and more millions and millions of dollars than anyone could ever imagine what to do with. Yet when we met, you said that you watched one of my videos to get a refund for your flight that was delayed. (laughs) (laughs) True story. Lufthansa flight from Athens uh, in July. And Lufthansa called a strike. It was a a strike. They shut, not a strike. I think it was just that they were shutting down a lot of flights through Germany, through through, um, Munich and Frankfurt. And we were rooting through Frankfurt. And I had watched your video and you read the small print. I hadn't. And we were going to be delayed six hours and transferred onto another airline. And I said to Raymond, I'm pretty sure we can get a credit for that flight that, you know, because they're putting us onto another airline. And Ray said, I don't think so. And I said, no, I, I'm not kidding, Erica. I said, I think so. I watched it on TikTok. <laughs> and he said, oh, Jane, for goodness sake. I said, okay, do me a favor. When we get back, let's just find out. We asked at the desk as we were waiting. They said they weren't aware of that. I said, okay, I'm pretty sure of it. And Erica, you, you got us a credit on a lift house. So we've got till, we have till next year, 2023, to use that credit, which we're going to use on a flight to London in November. Amazing. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So we have a little closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Jane Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this being able to say, Jane taught me this? Oh, gosh. Jane taught me I'm more than enough and never shrink myself. I love that. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's episode, I know you'll love Jane's book. It's called Skin in the Game, and I'll leave the link to it in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Eric Taught Me. I really appreciate it. If you want to support the podcast, follow us wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review if you haven't yet. If you're not sure what to say in the review, just let me know who your favorite guest has been. A new episode of Erica Taught Me is released every Tuesday, so I'll talk to you next week.